What if I told you that this flagship Z590 11900K that's not even a year old is completely bested and utterly destroyed in gaming by an $180 12600 Six cores beats the 11900K. Well, it does in gaming. That's six performance cores on Alder Lake, up to 4.6 gigahertz. Ah, oh, things are getting spicy. Things are heating up. That's what I've got in here. So this is from MSI, and this is a B660M motherboard. You see, AMD just announced their processors. You know, AM4, it's a, got a socket with long life. This is a B450 Tomahawk, but this is gonna be able to run the CPUs that AMD just announced. Now this CPU is gonna give those CPUs a run for their money, because this is a different microarchitecture, and the CPUs from AMD, while they're for an old socket, uh, it's just sort of a rehash of things that we've, we've already seen. So we sort of know what the single core performance is gonna be in a best case scenario. And games love that single core performance of Alder Lake. So this is the B660M Mortar Wi-Fi. This is a micro ATX motherboard with a duet uh, power delivery at 12 plus one plus one. Power delivery can be a little bit of a concern with Alder Lake because the 12900K will consume 241 watts plus uh, especially uh, if you're doing an overclock or something like that. But with six performance cores and no efficiency cores, well, the i5 is just not gonna reach anywhere near that. The TDP, you know, the TDP figure from Intel on the 12400 is 65 watts, but as we'll see, uh, it's not exactly that simple. But we'll take a look at that in a little bit more detail in a moment. Now, let's talk build strategy. So, this B660M motherboard, it's gonna be a little more expensive than the, the AM4 competition, but $180 is basically unrivaled in the market right now in terms of performance and value. And it's a perfectly valid build strategy. You know, if you wanna upgrade every generation, you shouldn't be buying the highest end. You should be buying the most bang for your buck part in that generation. And you will have almost as good a gaming performance as anybody else. Spoiler alert, this 12400, because it only has performance cores in some games, will actually outperform a 12900K. Asterisk, <laughs> the asterisk on that is that uh, those games are not really super well optimized for the efficiency cores and the performance cores. And so a lot of the time when you see a game that performs better with an all P core part, you could replicate that by disabling the E cores on your uh, 12900K. And most motherboards at this point have a software hack or a utility or some hot key that you can hit on the keyboard that when you're launching a game, it'll say, hey, anything that's launched from this point on, don't enable that on efficiency cores. And so the game ends up not being scheduled on those E cores. Of course, with our i5-12400 here, not a concern because we only have six of the high performance cores and that's it. I'm sort of uh, loading the equation here in terms of competition when maybe I shouldn't because, okay, yes, this is the B660M affordable motherboard, but if you look at the features, you know, this is a motherboard that was designed to be released in 2022. Some of the older motherboards, not really designed with that. So there's a lot of relatively high-end features on this board that you won't find on older competing boards, like two and a half gigabit ethernet. On a, on a B660 motherboard? We're getting two and a half gig ethernet? I'm saying, yeah, it's because the cost difference for moving from one gig to two and a half gig is basically negligible at this point. So on this motherboard, we have one PCIe 4.0 X16 slot and one PCIe 3.0 X16 slot. That's X16 physical, X4 electrical. There's also a DDR5 motherboard supporting up to 6200 OC. It also has all four slots, so you could run a configuration with four DDR5 DIMMs. Now, if you do run four DDR5 DIMMs, you're going to have to run the memory at a reduced speed. That's kind of a big thing with uh, DDR5. One DIMM per channel, single rank is up to 6200. One DIMM per channel, two rank is up to 5200. Two DIMM per channel, single rank is maximum speed 4000. And two DIMMs per channel, dual rank is also maximum speed 4000. This motherboard also has a lot of other things that I really like, like DisplayPort out in addition to HDMI out. 
10 gigabit and 20 gigabit, you know, it's dual channel, type C, um, USB connections, four USB type A connections. So it's like, yeah, it's a cost down motherboard. You don't really get as much USB resources, but we'll make that up by giving you a ton of USB 2 ports, which is great for peripherals and other low speed devices. This motherboard also has onboard Wi Fi 6E. You could save a few bucks to get the version of this motherboard that doesn't have onboard Wi Fi 6E, but if you need Wi Fi, Wi Fi 6E is pretty good. Other in the box accessories include two six gigabit per second SATA ports some inexpensive rubber duck antennas. Would have liked to have seen higher end antennas, but hey, remember, this is a B660M motherboard. We've also got some M.2 locking screws. These are awesome because it means that you're not gonna lose an M.2 screw. This is a little tab that you install and you flip it around and then it locks and unlocks the M.2. Got a keychain um, screwdriver set. And then our installation manual, there's a CD. Does anybody even have a CD-ROM anymore? Just don't even, we don't even need the CD-ROM, just a little card that says go on the website and download it. You don't, you don't need the CD-ROM. Case badge, stickers, all kinds of other stuff. And of course, the manual. Now the motherboard advertises HDMI 2.1, but this is technically only a 4K 60, hooking up to our LG uh, CX display, which is 4K 120. You're not gonna push 4K 120 with the Intel iGPU. Even though it's a newer iGPU, it just can't do 4K 120 over HDMI. Now, in terms of physical layout, again, even though this is you know a cost down motherboard, there's a lot of not cost down options here. One, the dims. Surface mount, it's not through hole. It's probably pretty standard for DDR5 at this point because signal integrity. We've got dual eight pin CPU power connections. Not gonna need that on this board. It's a 12 plus one plus one you know, duo power delivery. It, this is good though for a B660. You could run a 12900K in here, no problem. 241 watts would be doable. But this is the thing that you gotta watch. When you're working with cost down motherboards in LGA 1700, some of them stick very closely to the, the lower end of the Intel specification. And so not every B660 motherboard is gonna be capable of delivering full performance from whatever CPU that you put in here. There's also a lot of aluminum with this build. This is a lot of metal. This, this whole thing is basically one giant heat sink. It doesn't have fins or anything like that. It would be a lot more effective with something like that. But as long as you get a little bit of airflow in this area, uh, it's gonna be sufficient heat dissipation, especially for something like the 65 watt, 65 watt TDP 12400. I mean, come on. We also have dual M.2s. Both of those are 80 millimeter. If you're trying to rock some old enterprise 110 millimeter, this motherboard's probably not the motherboard for you. This motherboard also features four four pin fan headers. Might've been nice to see more fan headers or maybe just double up on fan headers for the CPU, but we do have a pump header at the top edge of the motherboard. Standard ATX 24 pin power connector, of course. And two digital RGB headers here and here, along with a 5050 RGB header. It should be noted the M.2 closer to the CPU is a PCIe type connection to the CPU. If you have a SATA type M.2, you will need to use that in the bottom slot. We also have a single PCI Express by one connection in case you have a PCI Express by one peripheral. This motherboard is set up for a two slot graphics card, but if you have a three slot graphics card, that PCI Express physical X16 electrical by four connection on the bottom edge of the motherboard will let you use other high speed peripherals. I could add a 10 gigabit ethernet card to this platform, no problem. There's not really anything special on the back of the motherboard except to see that the, the heat sinks for the VRM are spring loaded, which maybe helps it uh, grab on a little better as well as our heat sink for the chipset. So there's not much left to do except get this into a build and see how our performance is. All right, for this build, basically I've got my my test platform, my dev platform. We've got Kingston HyperX DDR5. This is not the fastest DDR5 you can get right now, but it is one of the best deals. I've also popped the heat sinks off of our motherboard. So this is pretty cool to get a built-in heat spreader. Optionally in the box, you've also got this toolless release thing that I mentioned. It's not great because you can't use the built-in heat sink. Now the SSD that I've, I've put on here is the uh, Intel 670p 2 terabyte. It's a very inexpensive M.2 if you catch my drift. So we don't really have to worry too much about the heatsink, but in general, the way that the M.2s are in this day and age, you really want a heat spreader or a heatsink or something on there. A nice feature of this motherboard I forgot to mention, built-in IO shield, good job MSI. So for cooling, the Freezer i35 ARGB, this is a modest cooler very modest price. Arctic has done a good job with this. Now, full disclosure, Arctic actually sent me one of these, which I ended up using in one of the Dev Ember giveaway builds. And then I was like, oops, 
I forgot to film the unboxing and all this stuff. So I ordered another one. Sometimes you can get a good deal on a closeout CPU cooler, but you gotta pay attention to the, the box because the box might not include LGA 1700 compatibility if you're doing a build like this. All right, so this is the correct orientation of your socket. See, it's sort of pinched in there and then the little nub things are pointing upward so that it'll grab onto the heat sink. Then all you gotta do, you know, it'll come with the fan pre-installed. All you gotta do is gently pry up on the sides, slide it around a little bit, it should pop off because you're gonna need to be able to access these two screws front and back in order to be able to mount it. Now for this processor, I usually just do kind of a, a line in the middle because it'll spread out because it's the silicon is directly underneath where I just spread that. Now when you're doing this, be aware that there are delicate sensitive surface mount components on the back of your motherboard. You don't want to scrape your motherboard around or and it'll mess up a flat surface. So in, in our case, you know, the motherboard backplate has given us a little bit of elevation here, but you still want to be careful because if you scrape any of these components off on the back, it's not going to work. Now, unlike some generic tower coolers that come with no-name thermal paste, this comes with Arctic MX-5. Listen, thermal paste from Arctic is one of the best products that, that Arctic makes. And so, an inexpensive cooler that includes MX-5, it's a nice little bonus. And if you find yourself shopping for cases, and you're looking at the case and saying, this is just a folded piece of metal for like $200. Plastic. This power supply was also on sale. It's an SFX power supply, but a lot of the time the SFX power supplies come with a little metal bracket that will adapt it into a full-size power supply. Now this is only 550 watts, but all of the money that I saved for you know this parts list, we can sort of dump that back into GPU, which if you're building a gaming machine, spending most of the budget on the GPU is probably where you should be. Now for the GPU in this build, I'm using the MSI 2080 Supreme. It's an older graphics card, but hey, graphics cards are still kind of hard to get. Now you could put a 3080 in here, 3080, you know, 3080X, the MSI 3080 Supreme also probably would be a pretty good choice. Well, here we are with a fresh install of Windows 11. I've got my chocolatey script running through and setting up Steam and CPU-Z and everything else. And we can see here that uh, AVX 512 is uh, disabled, even though this is an all P-Core CPU. Uh, Intel was threatening to fuse off AVX 512, and it sure looks like they have. So, you know, even if you get a K-series CPU, there was a little bit of a kerfuffle when the 12900K launched. If you disabled your E-Cores, you'd get AVX 512 back. These CPUs, Alder Lake doesn't support APX 512. And this is a CPU that only has P cores. And it's like, is there any kind of BIOS hackery to turn on AVX 512? On this particular CPU, that seems not to be the case. If you have an older Alder Lake and you disable E cores, you may be able to get AVX 512 back. But if you don't know what AVX 512 is, don't worry about it. It's a it's an instruction set that helps do vector math really quickly. But most of that math is happening on your GPU anyway. Never really took off, uh, at least on the desktop reasons I won't get into here but hey everything is working and it is a surprisingly zippy machine I mean those Alder Lake P cores really are something very nice and this platform you know <laughs> the worst thing about this platform honestly is the chipset expense for the motherboard makers because they've got to pay a lot for B660 and yes this does support base clock overclocking which is maybe something that I will revisit in a future video so that even though this is not a K CPU you've got a couple of options and notice that XMP is working well here as well 5200 so nice and we can see here that this CPU has no problem absolutely maxing out the performance of the 2080 super that would be true even if it were a 3080 because those P cores are no slouch now, whenever you build a new system, I strongly recommend running a couple benchmarks. There's 3D Mark on Steam. There's also Geekbench. And the Geekbench trial works just fine for sort of validating your build. I'm starting with Geekbench 5, and I just want to get the baseline numbers for Geekbench 5 and see how the system performs. And it's right in line with what I expect. Also, I want to check Hardware Info 64, the sensors section, to see if anything is overheating. Because your motherboard has a lot of sensors on it, but it doesn't usually cause anything bad to happen until you get into the red zone. So you can see something that is hotter than it should be, but not so hot the computer turns off. Uh, and that's not good for the long-term health of your machine. So, just the best practice. So, overall, I'm really happy with how this MSI build turned out. Again, thanks to MSI for sending over the B660M micro ATX motherboard so that I could give it a spin. And I am also planning to do some base clock overclocking with this 12400, even though it's not a K processor, you're not supposed to be able to overclock. I'm Wendell, this is level one. If you have any questions or you do a build like this and you wanna show it off in the forums, come to the level one forums. I'm hanging out there. All right, I'm signing out and I'll see you there.